Welcome back, everybody. You are listening to or watching episode 68 of Mastering Nutrition, the Ask Us Anything about sports nutrition with Chad Macias, Danny Lennon, and Alex Leaf that took place on May 25th, 2019 and was a private Ask Us Anything for members of the CMJ Master Pass. You can now hear all of our questions and answers. This is Mastering Nutrition with Chris Masterjohn. Take control of your health, master the science, and apply it like a pro. Are, are, are you ready? This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believed that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. And vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to AncestralSupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like 
no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium chain fats to keep my energy levels up too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's AmpleMeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, AmpleMeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um... All right, today we are doing Ask Us Anything About Sports Nutrition, and I'm here with uh, Danny Lennon, Alex Leaf, Chad Macias. I put the longer bios in the, um, in the registration link, but uh, Chad has coached over 2,500 athletes and is currently Director of Research and Development at the Institute of Human Kinetics. Danny Lennon serves as the nutritionist for athletes in powerlifting, weightlifting, MMA, boxing, and other combat Combat sports, sports. and hosts the Sigma Nutrition podcast. And And Alex Alex is a researcher for examine.com and uh, recently contributed to their fitness guide. And he works, if you follow my stuff, you know him from uh, our long-term Mastering Nutrition podcast, which we frequently uh, are on. So, um, looks like we, uh, Chad, are you here? Chad, you're here with us, right? You want to say hi? Chad? Okay. He might, he might be lagging behind. Okay. Danny, you look here. You want to say hi? All right. Hello guys. Thanks for uh, having me, Chris. Looking forward to chatting. Cool. Alex, you want to say hi? Sure. (laughs) Hey everybody. All right, cool. So um, it, the basic rules for asking questions are uh, you, can, you can put questions in. The main way people usually ask questions is in the Q&A. Um, we are not going to use the chat for asking questions. You can raise your hand if you'd like to share your audio or your video to ask a question. Um, if Oh, let me make sure. Okay. I always have to change the setting. Um, Okay, you can currently comment on other people's questions, and so if you want to join into a discussion where um, where you're responding to someone else's questions, do it in the Q and A by replying to that question. If someone does get invited on screen, um, then uh, the only way to reply to their question would be to use the chat. So the one thing that we'll use the chat for is um, is for those types of questions. Okay, so uh, Jillian Harkey has a question, and she says, Good morning. What are your thoughts on the effectiveness of serapeptase and castor oil packs for dissolving internal scar tissue that is impeding nerve signaling 
and for acetyl L-carnitine for nerve regeneration. Are there any nutritional imbalances that they can cause? Do you have any other suggestions for dissolving internal scar tissue and helping nerves regenerate? I'm six months post-op and feel I'm running out of time. Um, okay, that's uh, not quite a sports nutrition question, but do you guys have any thoughts on that? I honestly don't. Uh, I've got nothing on that, so I'll hand it over to Alex if you have anything, but I'm unfamiliar of uh, any literature on, on that specific question. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Julian, uh, none of us um, have something for that. Okay, Marcus Matthiasen says, when supplementing with beta alanine, do you think there is a risk of depleting histidine? Also, apart from beta alanine, what else do you recommend to buffer or lower lactate? Any thoughts? Yeah, I got something. Uh, you're not going to uh, deplete histidine. There'd have to be some kind of condition where there was a deficiency. Um, we just don't synthesize enough for that to take place. Uh, in terms of buffering, um, beta alanine, of course, is probably the go-to. You want to try to do intracellular buffering if you can. If you're looking for extracellular buffering, uh, such as uh, bicarbonate or even creatine, you've already lost the competition because you've already you're waiting for a pH drop uh, for it to take effect. So obviously, beta alanine is the best buffer. Um, there is a transdermal carnosine gel available on the market. I've actually uh, uh, conducted peer-reviewed research on it. Um, it is called Lactigo Gel, so you might want to look into that. Uh, there's no loading phase; it gets directly in the muscle in less than an hour. Um, so it's a little bit more of an effective way than beta alanine because you don't have to deal with um, the uh, deficiencies in oral metabolization of carnosine because that's a big issue and why there's a high non-responder rate with beta alanine supplementation. Uh, so that is one way you can kind of get around that and that's available. Uh, other than that, I can't really think of too many things that you would use for a buffer that actually have efficacy. Chad, how, how um, are, are beta alanine and the transdermal carnosine, would you see those as alternatives to one another or would there be a rationale for using both of them? I don't really see a point in using both of them um, unless you know how you respond to beta alanine because there is a high non-responder rate and 97% of uh, orally ingested beta alanine goes to non-carnosine directed pathways. Um, that's one of the things we... Uh, found out when we were doing our research. So even if you are a responder, you're getting such a small percentage. And even even that small percentage, if you look at the literature, does show in responders that it can significantly increase um, carnosine stores within the muscle. But uh, it, I, I wouldn't say that there would need to be a synergistic effect or the use of both, um, one or the other. I mean, obviously, the transdermal is a better route because it gets in immediately. There's no loading phase. Um, and you can guarantee there won't be any issues with oral catabolization. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that you would need to do both. Where where do you get a transdermal carnosine gel? Um, as far as I know, it's it's available um, through their website. Um, it's FDA approved, and it's a clean product for sport. Um, I don't know much about the sales side. Of what, what's the, what's the brand name of it? Brad, what's the, what is the brand name of it? Oh, it looks like we might have lost Chad. Okay. It's called... Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. What, what was it? Okay, I'll put that, um, put that in the show notes. Um, so I have a question that I want to throw out into the mix. There was... There was a question in one of my previous Q and A's that um, that I really wasn't in a position to respond to, and the question was: um, there are many uh, there are many form different brands and formulations of um, of nutrition to provide hydration and and glucose or fructose or different combinations of glucose and fructose for sports performance during exercise. And um, do you guys have any opinion on, um, in a generic sense, whether there are diff there, whether there are, if you're to fuel exercise during the exercise, 
what mix of glucose and fructose or other nutrients you should be using, and if there are any brands or products that would be preferred. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Anyone? No. What was that, Chris? Sorry, I got dropped off for a second. Oh, that's right. Um, for for fueling uh, for fueling exercise, intra exercise um, carbohydrate and uh, and nutrient repletion, um, do, is it better to have uh, glucose or fructose or the two in, in certain combinations? And are are there any products on the market that are good fuels? Um, or better, that that are, that have any superiority in terms of uh, fueling exercise during the performance. Um, I'm not too uh, aware of, like specific products that do that. Um, uh, all the athletes that we work with, especially like uh, ultra endurance, like Brett McManus and um, Iron Man, things of that nature, we use like maple syrup and hard candies to feel these guys. Um, it's definitely best to have a ratio um, between uh, glucose and fructose. You want to definitely use both fuels, and hopefully the athlete has already trained their gut to maximize carbohydrate absorption at around 90 grams an hour. So uh, if you're going to do that, it, it definitely needs to be a varied fuel source. Uh, you can't, you're going to maximize your, your transporters. Um, with a glucose, you could end up with uh, GI distress. If you had too much, you would uh, definitely have problems with osmolality of your uh, of your uh, fluids. So you definitely got to have a mix. Uh, it, it really is going to depend on how well the athlete has trained their gut on how you... Um, how, how do you train the gut to absorb during exercise? Do you just do you just fuel it a lot? just super uh, physiological doses of carbohydrate. Um, you got to use it in training and so you, uh, basically, that, you basically give yourself diarrhea until it doesn't give you diarrhea. <laughs> Essentially you give yourself some diarrhea, get some GI distress and find out where your, your balance is going to be. But you, you definitely have to use both sources. If you're going to maximize you're you're going to be sitting at around 60 grams an hour. If you don't use multiple transport carbohydrates and that's just going to limit the athlete and slow them down. So, the ratio, I mean, it's, it's, it, it really will vary, but you're going to be at closer to like a two to one ratio with glucose to fructose, but that's too simplistic. It's going to be, it's going to fall somewhere on either side of that. So something that's half sucrose and uh, half dextrose powder. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that reminds me of, a, of a, um, a jam that I made when I was trying Lyle McDonald's ultimate 2.0 diet and preparing for the photo shoot that's on my website. And, uh, I tried doing, so the carb, the, so the, the gist of this is you, uh, you go through a carb de- and this was Alex's idea. You go through a carb depletion period and, uh, and you do maximal glycogen depleting workouts. And then you do a carb refeed that for my body, um, for my body weight, calculated out to 1200 grams of carbs over the course of 30 hours. And, um, I, I did three cycles of this. And the first time I, um, I, I didn't plan it very well. And I, and I was like, the the refeed came up and I was like, Oh no, what am I going to eat? So I went and bought some, uh, sourdough toast and some honey and, uh, and jam. And, I felt really good at first, but then I was getting this really slamming headache that just got worse and worse the more I refed the rest of the day. And I was like, I don't know if it's the gluten in the bread or if it's the, uh, the iron that they add to it, or if it's all the fructose that I'm eating or whatever. Cause, um, cause that was a lot of fructose. And I actually write, I, I have some testing that I don't, I don't absorb fructose very well. So that probably could have been a problem. Um, so the second and third refeed I did, I, I got unsweetened jam and I sweetened it with dextrose powder and I put that on rice cakes and I, I actually felt amazing. And, um, my, so I, I now absorb fructose. So I probably don't count as, as the ratio person. Um, but, I, but the big difference was I was probably getting like 50% fructose. so like five or 600 grams of, of, uh, 
well, I didn't get to 1200, but it would have been five, five or 600 grams of fructose if it were half. Um, it might've been 30 or 40%. I probably only hit like eight or 900, but still, so it's a few hundred grams of fructose versus, uh, the second two and three, when I felt really great, it was probably like 10% fructose. Um, so anyway, not, not too relevant, but an interesting anecdote to throw out there. That's actually pretty funny, Chris. <laughs> you, you, could, you wouldn't have enough GLUT2, GLUT5 transporters if you took all the three of us that are on this. Um, <laughs> That's so much. It's ridiculous. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, like I said, it was unplanned. And so uh, I, I didn't have, um, I should have thought, <laughs> I should have thought through it, but the headache that I got, made me think through it for time two and time three, which, uh, the, which went a lot better. That's the thing about those uh, super high carbohydrate refeeds. They, they sound great for anyone that hasn't tried them first because it sounds like yeah. a ton of carbohydrate, but it's uh, the logistics are very different when you have to yeah. keep fat intake low. Mm. Yeah, not so fun. Okay, Marcus says, what's your opinion on using mitochondrial support such as D-ribose, CoQ10, and PQQ to increase exercise performance? Any of you guys seen data on that? I haven't seen data, but I wouldn't think there's any biological plausibility there for uh, noticing change that would give us magnitude to notice it. Yeah, I would agree with this, that same. I think it seems like a something you're not going to be able to detect from, from that. My, my guess, um, my guess is if you, if you took someone who had, uh, I don't know, a mitochondrial problem that would benefit from these things, then maybe you might see it in that person, but probably not in, um, I don't know. There's probably an edge case of some people somewhere who just feel like crap all the time. And some of these things help, but maybe not as a, not in a sports performance population. Yeah, we have some preliminary data with uh, D-ribose showing that it increases energy levels and well-being in people with fibromyalgia. Um, CoQ10 can increase the energy levels of people who have had heart disease um, or had suffered heart attacks. And all these come back to because they do support mitochondrial energy production, but those mitochondria were uh, deficited or damaged beforehand. So you could speculate maybe in like a hard training athlete um, that using some of these could help uh, reduce the amount of oxidative stress that a mitochondria would encounter from having to work while you run hundreds of miles, but there isn't any data on that. So I think that that kind of gets at um, uh, an issue that's difficult to tease out in the literature sometimes. So that the principle there that you're mentioning, Alex, is pretty similar to what we were looking at when we did the, the riboflavin podcast, where there's really not good data that riboflavin supplementation can improve exercise performance but there's pretty solid data that the more you exercise, the more you divert riboflavin into fat oxidation pathways and away from pathways that you would expect to protect you from oxidative stress over the long term. Like riboflavin is needed for glutathione reductase, which is needed for antioxidant uh, defense and to keep everything working nice and long. Um, and so you can measure that in the blood and you can show that as a mark of riboflavin status, the more you exercise, the more it declines and the more riboflavin you need in your diet to normalize it. Uh, but it's kind of hard to make a good hypothesis of a real hard endpoint that you would measure in a study to demonstrate the clinical or practical effect of decreasing antioxidant status. Um, you know, like you'd expect that to worsen the risk of chronic disease you could maybe hypothesize that it might get in the way of recovery, um, maybe, uh, but it's it's more clear that you would expect long-term damage over the course of months or years of having slightly lower antioxidant defense. And I think it's, it's real hard to, um, well, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that not everything that factors into sports nutrition is going to, there are things that could be relevant that aren't going to directly impact the sports performance, right? So your, your body, if, uh, if your body needs to perform, um, it's going to divert a lot of resources into performing and 
you might not have something like one of these supplements that would impact that performance because your body's able to divert everything into that way. But maybe over the course of 10 or 20 years, um, mild increases in oxidative stress or mild decreases in defenses actually have some kind of negative effect. Um, but yeah, it sounds, it sounds like the bottom line is, uh, if you're, if you have fibromyalgia or heart disease, that's kind of a, kind of a separate issue. But if you're feeling like crap all the time, you're not going to have very good sports performance. All right. Um, Zachary asks, what are some important nutritional strategies that could help with recovery from soft tissue injuries, like muscles, ten tendons, and ligaments from lifting? Um, I can give a few practical things that we typically do with some of our lifters. Um, and then I'm sure some of the guys can jump in on some of the detailed stuff around it. Um, a few of the basic heuristics that we would uh, give to the athletes. One would be around energy availability, making sure they're either eucaloric or hypercaloric. So in other words, there's a tendency for athletes to want to use their injured time productively and maybe try and diet down, which is obviously just counterproductive to that recovery process. Mm -hmm. So we try and main, make sure they're um, at weight maintenance or even a very slight uh, surplus if if um, that ends up happening, that's not too much of an issue. Um, high protein intake. So this probably around two grams per kilo of body weight, which uh, or uh, possibly even more. So four in pounds, I guess that's what, 0.9 or one, one gram per pound, something around that area. Um, potentially there could be an issue if they uh, have some micronutrient deficiencies. So either through diet, and or supplementation addressing some of those can be beneficial to recovery um, if it's a tendinopathy specifically um, there is some data but there's it's still uh, i don't think totally in agreement or at least there's a lack of consensus um, but there is some work looking at the combination of gelatin and vitamin c um, and again there, there's kind of some nuance there and some disagreement but that may be potentially worth looking at and then if it's an injury where a lifter has a limb immobilized, um, we can maybe look at some supplementation of creatine, um, maybe some leucine, omega-3s to varying degrees. There's some different data on each of those potentially showing some uh, benefits when we have an immobilized limb to prevent some of the muscle atrophy. Um, how much of a difference that's going to make, it's kind of hard to know in practice, but they're kind of, it's, it's a relatively no real downside to some of that stuff. So there are some basic heuristics we've used with some of the lifters. Um, but again, some, some of them more well supported than others. Anyone else? All right. Thanks, Zach. Um, Nicholas Simpson asks, is there any evidence or thought to how beta alanine supplementation might impact B5 pantothenic acid status or vice versa? I'm not, Nicholas, can you, um, I'm not sure why they would be related. Do you guys? No. No, um, I'm too sure. N Nicholas, if you want to follow up and, and clarify your, your question, why you would expect them to be related, we might have a better ability to, to get at that. Um, Reinhold Innerhofer says, is AMPK the primary regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis in muscle, or there, are there other important pathways that need to be considered and which can be targeted by nutrition in addition to endurance training? Um, anyone want to take a stab at that? Nicholas is following up in the chat. Oh, um, in the meantime, I'm going to, I'm going to answer Nicholas. So, Nicholas says pantothenic acid is the amide between pantoic acid and beta alanine. Okay. So I see where he's going with this. Um, I don't think they'd be related at all. Uh, and, and so in bacteria um, and plants, they synthesize pantothenic acid by joining pantoic acid to beta alanine. Um, but in humans and animals, when you, First of all, we don't synthesize pantothenic acid at all. 
Um, so we're not going to use beta alanine to synthesize pantothenic acid. And second of all, um, second of all, we don't digest pantothenic acid down to pantoic acid and beta alanine. Bacteria do. Um, so if if there were any link <clears throat> whatsoever, it would be mediated by gut microbes. Um, and I guess, I guess conceivably, like um, conceivably, you could have some beta alanine that's that is used to synthesize pantothenic acid somewhere in the gut <clears throat> if it gets down far enough, and maybe some of that would get into us. Um, and conversely, maybe conversely, there is about fifty percent of dietary B five that is not absorbed. And so probably some of it could make it into a bacteria's uh, pan pantothenic acid, pantoic acid, beta alanine cycle. Um, but for the most part, I would say you would not expect any, any significant relationship on the basis that in humans, we don't synthesize pantothenic acid and we don't break it down. So when we break down derivatives of pantothenic acid, um, they... Uh, the most basic thing that we pee out in the urine is pantothenic acid. Um, so I would not, I would not expect on that basis, beta alanine supplementation impact B5 status or vice versa. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on um, let's taking a stab at, at this uh, AMP quick K question? So from my perspective, um, so my, mitochondrial biogenesis is, is going to occur in part in response to energy, energy um, depletion. And AMPK is a, um, is a major player in signaling energy depletion. AMPK is not... I think um, when we think of... Um, I think we have a tendency to to single out certain things like AMPK or insulin as um, as like uh, chief regulators of things when they're not really chief. There, there really are no chief regulators in some sense. I think a better model to think about metabolic regulation is is really more like a um, like it like multiple nodes in a network of communication. And so, um, like, if if you think of like a computer program, uh, there's probably some some lines of code that you could delete and have no effect on the program, and others that you might delete and it, the program just breaks down. Um, but the way the information is flowing is really information is captured in multiple areas, uh, go passing through multiple nodes, and there's a lot of redundancy. Um, so there are there AMPK is is one of um, many, or at least several, uh, regulators of energy depletion. Um, but like if you came up with a drug that activated AMPK, you are, um, you are, you're not going to mimic the full effects of energy depletion because if the drug is specific enough to AMPK, um, it's just not going to hit the other nodes that are all signaling energy depletion. And I th even metformin, which is seen as an AMPK activator, uh, appears, uh, and I'll have to dig into the literature more on this, but it appears from what I've seen so far that actually it's targeting ATP production and it's, um, it's depleting ATP. And so that will activate AMPK and it, and it will also activate many other uh, nodes of mitochondrial energy depletion. Um, but even metformin, I think still, and this, this, I'm going to write a blog post on this at some point, it's still only mimicking about half of fasting physiology because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of markers that are not downstream from ATP production of the energy status of the cell, like, uh, like the NAD, NADH ratio, citrate, and stuff like that, and things in the cytosol that are not in the mitochondria. Um, and so I, I think that um, it's probably counterproductive to get so granular as to think of an enzyme or a signaling molecule that is the primary regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis because um, at the end of the day, 
your your pro- from a training perspective, you're probably not going to um, you're probably not going to be like high dosing resveratrol or taking metformin or something to increase performance. You're going to be using the sport that you're interested in training to cause the energy depletion that would cause the mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, so it, it probably just, I, I, I don't, I doubt it's productive to focus on the granularity of the single, um, the single driver of biogenesis. Anyone else have any uh, thoughts to share on that question? Me, no, you, uh, you pretty much nailed it, but there's, there's multiple different things that um, influence the uh, transcriptional factors for mitochondrial biogenesis and PK just being one of them. There's PGC. Um, there's, there's a lot of different uh, transcriptional factors. Like you said, focusing on one isn't going to make a lot of sense because biogenesis is influenced by oxidative stress. It's influenced by um, extreme energy deficiencies. It's influenced by um, uh, endurance and all these different things. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Chris, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Mm. Okay. Zachary Lehman says, what are common nutrient deficiencies and imbalances that athletes can run into when in a significant calorie deficit for weight loss on a high protein diet? Anyone want to grab that one? I can uh, jump in if um, no one else wants to take it. Um, So I, I guess this, I'll use this as a way maybe to deflect to a bigger issue before circling back to a specific answer. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, any type of description of a diet, like a high protein diet really doesn't tell us all that much about what nutrient deficiencies someone may run into regardless, because there's an endless number of ways to set up a high protein diet that look very different, uh, specifically from a micronutrient perspective. And this goes beyond high protein diets. This goes for every type of nutrient or dieting strategy that's classified based on macronutrient composition. Um, Or even if you're thinking about what a vegan diet is, for example, there's so many different ways of what that diet might look like that will influence the um, efficacy and and impact of that diet. So it's hard to know from that perspective specifically about high protein diets. Um, But in general, with a significant calorie deficit, of course, just by nature of eating less food, you're running the risk of um, taking in less micronutrients and therefore running a higher risk of nutrient deficiencies. I think with that, without knowing what the composition of foods the athlete is on, we can't really answer that question too much. Apart from saying, if you were to generalize, you could probably look at what nutrients on average the people in the general population don't seem to consume in that high amount. And then be kind of sure that they're, they're going to be consuming even less than that. So maybe target it that way. Um, but the way to kind of just circumnavigate that is to look at the foods they are consuming and maybe put a priority on some that they're running a higher risk of. So I don't know if I have a specific answer to that without knowing the actual content of the diet. Anyone else want to jump in? Um, well, well, I would want to make sure that a lot of the way that you're cooking food and the way that you're um, like the specific sources of the high protein on the diet are going to be working in your favor. Uh, I mean, we have data showing that simply modifying the way that you cook the meat in your diet without changing anything else in the diet can affect levels of insulin resistance and uh, like AGE production. Um, And so you know, when you're losing weight, weight loss normally trumps everything when it comes to health. And so if you're doing a high protein, like for example, protein sparing modified fast, uh, it's going to be short term by definition, unless you're planning on like starving yourself and going above and beyond what would be healthy. Um, so assuming that that's not your goal, then it would probably be best to focus most of to get most of your high protein intake from gently cooked animal sources of protein to maintain that high bioavailability and protein quality in the diet but also ensuring that you're eating 
uh, ample fibrous vegetables for the polyphenols and prebiotic fibers that will help offset the protein putrefaction that will occur in your colon from any of the undigested protein that makes it down there. Uh, we do have overwhelming data showing that the fermentation of protein in the colon damages the lining and has cancerous and genotoxic effects. Uh, both mechanistically, these pathways are well established as well as uh, experimentally giving animals high protein diets and even some human studies uh, in obese adults feeding them high protein diets. I would, uh, I'd throw in here that um, one of the, <clears throat> one of the interesting things that we came across in when we were doing our riboflavin podcast is that when you, when you go into a caloric deficit, you're burning more fat and fat requires about twice as much riboflavin to, to, uh, to be oxidized as carbohydrate does. And the markers of riboflavin status, the amount of riboflavin that you need to, to, to uh, minimize markers of riboflavin deficiency increases about 60% when you're, when you're following a standard um, weight loss diet. And that is, um, that's accompanying the fact that you're eating less food and therefore, unless you shift your diet around or eating less riboflavin, and if you do, I haven't seen it measured with lifting, but if you do um, five to six days of cardio for 20 to 50 minutes per week, that's been shown to also increase riboflavin requirements by about 60%. So if you have someone who's in a caloric deficit and they're doing cardio five or six days a week um, for a half an hour a day, that person's riboflavin requirement is probably doubling. And that's in the context of a declining riboflavin. So there's that. And then um, there's not good quantification of this, but high protein intakes do increase needs for B6. And that's a result of B6 being involved in all the transaminases that handle protein metabolism. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't have data on how much it goes up for any given amount of protein. And um, there are some interesting animal experiments showing high protein diets increase needs for vitamin A, but I've never seen that replicate in humans. Uh, so there's a couple of things to watch out for. Chad, did you want to add anything in here? Um, the one thing I would say uh, it's related, but more down the road related in the sense that if you have anybody on a high protein diet or even standard American diet, uh, you definitely want to make sure you're getting 20 grams of digestive resistance starch every single day. Uh, that's the only thing that's going to help with anti-neoplastic protection against uh, the cancer that Alex was mentioning. So you, especially if you're on a high protein diet, you want to make sure you're getting that digestive resistance starch at least 20 grams a day. Can you, uh, can you throw a, a general picture of what that looks like in terms of food? Sure. The two the two best sources that we always recommend are mashed potatoes or um, <clears throat> white rice. And as you may or may not have heard mentioned, you can cool it to room temperature, reheat, and cool it again, and it will basically double the digestive resistance start content as well as reduce. Uh, so it is a a way to increase yeah, you, its, uh, you broke, start you broke up a little bit when you, its you broke up a little bit when you were saying and also reduce and then I, you dropped out for a second uh, it can also reduce uh, um, the insulin footprint so okay. if you uh, heat and cool heat and cool it'll reduce insulin got it response um, I'll throw in there too for those of you who weigh your food out uh a cooked and cooled potato contains about four to five percent of its weight as resistant starch. So to get 20 grams, it would be as simple as eating, uh, what's 20 times 20? Whatever 20 times 20 is, that many grams? Yeah, 400 grams of potatoes. 400 grams of potatoes would give you 20 grams of resistant starch if they were cooked and cooled. Cool. 
Uh, Reinhold Innerhofer says, for gaining muscle mass, what are top, the top priorities in nutrition and which supplements make a difference? And then in the context of this question, he wants a critique of his own pre-workout drink. It contains 25 grams of maltodextrin, 10 grams of BCAAs, arginine alpha-ketoglutarate, 5 grams, 5 grams of Creapure, 2 grams of beta-alanine, 2 grams of citrulline malate, 2 grams of taurine, and two grams of hydroxymethylbutyrate. Um, so uh, I guess there's a general question here. What are the top nutrition and uh, prior, top priorities for gaining muscle mass? And the sort of uh, specific question is, uh, which of these make me cut? Well, one thing, one thing I would say uh, that you can do is there's obviously been quite a bit of debate about the protein timing in the window post-training for maximizing protein accretion. And dis despite what some of the um, empirical evidence would suggest, I think it's very practical to get protein as quickly as you can post-training uh, simply for the fact that, that you're going to have a small window where uh, protein breakdown is going to be essentially halted and it only makes sense to ramp up um, muscle protein synthesis as quickly and, and to the highest extent possible during that time to give you the best amount of time uh, to, to allow for protein accretion. Even though measuring whole body protein synthesis isn't the best way to understand what's happening um, at the, within the muscle themselves, um, it, it certainly is a marker that you are in a net balance in your favor. And it, it makes sense to try to seek that immediately post-training. Do you, do you think that applies even if you had a big dose of protein very soon before training? Um, cause uh, like the, the perspective of, um, or at least my, my take home on, uh, Brad Schoenfeld and Alan Aragon's argument is, that the training window isn't that important if your training is approximately between uh, two high protein meals four hours apart. And so on that, like if you woke up fasted and you trained, then you definitely want to eat protein as soon as you stopped. Whereas if you ate, uh, if you took, you know, 40 or 50 grams of protein right before your workout, your amino acid levels would still be elevated enough to support you for another hour or two. What's, what's your take on whether that modifies it or not? Um, uh, I can remember actually Stu Phillips publishing a paper about this and talked about the muscle full effect and how it would still be advantageous to ingest protein post-training um, because you would be falling victim to the muscle full effect. It, I can't remember which one of his papers that he discussed it, but I would say yes, it's, it still makes sense to do that. Um, there's a, a few different scenarios where this can actually um, play a different role too, and if it, it, there's context that is important. So if you've done, for example, heavy eccentric training, uh, we know that at the 12-hour post-training mark, there's a second and robust increase in muscle protein synthesis regardless of um, dietary intake. And so um, there's also some arguments to be made for introducing uh, casein or uh, getting uh, protein in a meal at that uh, second 12-hour post-training mark as well. But yeah, I, I still think based upon Stu Phillips' work, it makes sense to, to still introduce protein in that um, post-training window, even if you've had a meal prior. Cool. Um, anyone else want to take a stab at this question, uh, either adding to the protein point or what supplements are top priorities for gaining muscle mass? So just looking at the, the ones he's included there, I think uh, creatine that he's mentioned is obviously one with the most evidence behind it and is overwhelmingly positive in general with very little downside. Um, the rest seems to be some that are uh, of differing uh, levels of, of evidence, but of um, declining amounts of effect, I would say. So beta alanine, we've already talked about. Um, the rest you, you can find some uh, benefit for. Um, Depending on the context of the rest of his diet, whether the maltodextrin is necessary, you could probably make a good argument that some uh, acute 
carbohydrate ingestion probably could benefit uh, the workout or at the very least re- reduce the perceived rate of exertion. Um, branched chain amino acids, again, depends on when the previous meal was beforehand. And as Chad has talked about, the, the protein feeding that's going to happen afterwards may make that not really that of that much importance. Um, HMB, again, a lot of mixed stuff on HMB, um, depending on the form that is used. He hasn't mentioned here, um, whether it's um, calcium salt form or not. Um, well, why would that make a difference? Just, just depending on the type of how much literature is being based on each. Uh, so there's a lot more on calcium salt form than um, free acid form, for example. Um, yeah, I, I can't really say too much more about the, like, there's nothing major that stands out. I'd say you need to get rid of immediately uh, from his pre-workout. Um, and his original question was around top priorities for, let me see, oh, gaining muscle mass. So uh, the big one that I talk about, I think it might be, we'll probably talk about it in another question as well. Um, the biggest thing to realize is that the training stimulus is probably of most importance and that sometimes gets forgotten in, in nutritional discussions that the getting the training stimulus right is, is going to far outweigh the nutrition you have around that per se. After that's taken care of, then uh, protein uh, intake in terms of per meal dose, how that's distributed across the day, um, and then the timing relative to the training. And Chad has just talked about that. Um, for maximizing muscle mass, you probably want to, again, be at least at uh, eucaloric intake, but probably more than likely a slight calorie surplus is going to be of benefit. Um, and then uh, the rest comes down to what you can what will help you drive the best performance in those lifting sessions and a recovery from that. So that could be for someone, what is their um, carbohydrate intake, how they distribute their calories and carbohydrates across the day to benefit that training session. Um, uh, And then from there, you're really getting down then into supplementation, which we've just mentioned. There's some, um, he looks to have kind of ticked off most of the ones that I would have recommended and not much else I can say there. So uh, I don't know how much detail I want to go into any of that, but as an overview level, there are some of the kind of key things I would take off. So I have a, I have a quick follow-up question on the, on the topic of um, carbohydrate timing. I get this is a little bit of a tangent, but um, there, I think there's a lot of people who are interested in uh, periodizing the the amount of, of stress and depletion and repletion in the workout. Do you think that for, I guess for gaining muscle mass, and maybe it's a different question if the priority is not for gaining muscle mass, but for gaining muscle mass, do you think there's any value to training in partially depleted or, or fasted states periodically? Or is it a matter of always wanting to support the best performance acutely that you can to get the best training stimulus to be the overwhelming driver of muscle mass gain? Yeah. So for muscle mass specifically, um, I don't know if there's much of a rationale for having uh, like low glycogen availability or low carbohydrate intake for driving more muscle mass. The only mechanism I can imagine there is if someone says, well, if we can have low carbohydrate or low glycogen availability for these training sessions and we get these uh, changes at the level of uh, the muscle in terms of that gene expression and increased mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, Therefore, in the long term, potentially someone's work capacity could go up and be able to do more volume. Like That's a very roundabout way of looking at it that I don't know is going to have much of an effect. I think carbohydrate restriction for specific training sessions is just much more valuable if you're looking at driving some of those changes in, like I said, mitochondrial biogenesis and so on for athletic performance in certain sports. Um, But I can't see the rationale if someone's goal is solely to maximize the amount of muscle mass. Um, Maybe someone has a different point in that, but I think if that's the sole goal, it would make sense to have high energy availability uh, going into that training session um, be able to put in the most work, uh, 
that's that's tolerable um, or a, an appropriate workload, let's say, and then be able to recover from that. Um, but the carbohydrate restriction and periodization, I think, is more a matter of athletic performance. So I don't know if the two guys have uh, something different to offer. You guys want to add anything? I don't have anything to add specific on that, but just to uh, touch up back on the pre, uh, pre-workout pre protein ingestion. So one one of the things that to be concerned about, um, and I don't know if it was Stu Phillips' paper that really outlined this from a mechanistic perspective, but if you ingest protein uh, pre-workout, you're going to cause an increase in muscle protein synthesis. So that that's going to take place regardless Um, it doesn't matter if you're going to train or not. And that, 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 uh, increase in mTOR, uh, C1 signaling is not going to be influenced post training. So even, even if you increase amino acid availability in the plasma, mTOR is not going to increase back to those same levels again, um, that you obtained pre-workout. So the concern is long period longitudinally are you going to be inhibiting your potential muscle growth and i think the answer would definitely have to be yes uh, you don't want to limit mTOR signaling uh, you want it to, you definitely want to be uh, having mTOR signaling uh, increased at the time that you're trying to maximize accretion and so even if you're you're, you're definitely not going to take all your protein before training so you're, you're, you're trying to maximize accretion post-training and you definitely want mTOR to help in that process. So even if you increase amino acid availability post-training, you're not going to trigger the signaling cascade back to the pre-training levels that you triggered it the first time when you ingest the protein. So are you arguing that you should not have pre-workout protein or just that you shouldn't put it all pre-workout? Um, I'm arguing that you shouldn't have pre-workout protein within an hour or two of your training session. If, if okay. your singular goal is, is uh, gaining muscle mass, you would want to make sure that you do not cause that increase in mTORC prior to training. So a couple hours out would be fine. Okay. So <clears throat> if you do your training in the morning, get up and eat breakfast, wait two hours and work out or train fasted and then make sure that you're, and then get immediate pro- post-workout protein. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's very practical if that's your yeah. singular goal. I never thought of, yeah, I never, never considered, never knew about or thought about the, um, the mTOR spike from the protein and meeting it afterwards. Interesting. Um, Alex, you, you did some, you did a research project on BCAAs recently, didn't you? Uh, do you have any any uh, anything to add on the BCAA point? Do they, they are they valuable if you're getting enough protein, or uh, what do you think? So BCAAs uh, are first of all probably worse than just using pure leucine um, because we have to add to that valine and isoleucine compete with leucine for absorption in the intestinal tract as well as entry into muscle tissue. Uh, they use the same transporters. And so we do have some data showing that, for example, taking a very low dose of whey protein with an excessive amount of pure leucine can stimulate the muscle protein synthetic response back up to a level you'd see with an adequate dose of pure whey protein. But when you provide that same amount of leucine, but then also throw in other, the uh, isoleucine and valine alongside it, then you don't see that response. Uh, the response is the same as if you just never added the BCAs to begin with. Um, and it's and the only logical reason for that is because they all compete for the same transporters, both through absorption in the gut and into muscle tissue. Um, in a fasted state, they see absolutely no reason to take BCAs unless your goal is to prevent protein breakdown. So they can help minimize protein breakdown, but they can do absolutely nothing for muscle growth. Uh, Simply based on logic alone, uh, you need 20 amino acids to synthesize protein. And you're going to only provide three of the nine amino acids that your body itself cannot make. So what will happen is when you take the BCAAs or even just isolated leucine by itself, 
you're going to see a short transient spike of muscle protein synthesis that lasts about one to one and a half hours. And all this does is it takes all the essential amino acids that are currently in circulation and it'll send them into muscle tissue. Uh, but once you run out of essential amino acids, then where are you going to get them? Uh, when you're in a fasted state, muscle protein supplies 85% of the amino acids that the rest of your body uses to sustain your life. And so you can't like try to build muscle, but then break down that muscle to provide the substrate to then rebuild that muscle. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So muscle protein synthesis becomes halted when you only use BCAs um, because your body runs out of the other essential amino acids. Uh, the other thing you see is that muscle protein breakdown does increase alongside the increase in muscle protein synthesis with BCAs uh, so that you can, the body's kind of stupid in this regard and it like tries to supply the substrate that uh, it needs to just take back up to build the new muscle. Uh, so it's like spinning your wheels basically. My personal take is that um, everything that BCAs might help with that we've seen in the literature, we've seen whey protein and protein supplements in general also do it, except they do it better and they do it more consistently. So I wouldn't use BCAAs in a pre-workout drink. I would just use protein if that was your goal. Yeah, so it's it sounds like um, if you wanted to use and and jump in to correct me if I'm if I'm wrong on any of these summary points. So if you if you wanted to use um, BC, BCAAs in, in principle, you should just be using leucine instead of BCAAs, but would you want to do that at all? And then the question is, if you're in a fasted state and you're low protein, you could increase muscle synthesis by just adding leucine or adding leucine to an inadequate dose of protein, but you're not going to be in a better position as if you had gotten all that protein. And then to mix this with Chad's most recent point, um, you might want, not want to do that anyway, because uh, the take home from what, what Chad was saying, if I understood properly, is that, you know, at, at least, so leucine is one of the stimulators of mTOR. And so at least part of that protein response, that protein synthesis response is going to be mediated by mTOR. And, um, and what you don't want is to jack up the, the baseline of mTOR before your workout, because then it's much harder to exceed it to meet or exceed it in the post-workout and you're if i understood him right you're kind of desensitizing yourself yourself to the anabolic response to that and so if you were going to be in a fasted state or inadequate protein state before your workout uh you'd probably just want to keep that fasting physiology going and then make and then make up for it in your post-workout protein rather than trying to spike up protein synthesis uh, or prevent it from dropping too low in the fasted state um, since your net benefit, according to what Chad was saying, would be to, um, to not have it jacked up too much before the workout and to really focus on jacking it up after the workout. Um, and so looks like BCAAs probably sounds like there's no reason to use BCAAs. <laughs> Anyone disagree with that? No. <laughs> okay. Um, Anyone have any thought? He throws in phosphatic acid. I think he might mean phosphatidic acid. Anyone have any thoughts on, uh, on that? Seen anything on that in muscle growth? I've seen that in the context, I think, of decreasing cortisol in combination with uh, phosphatidylserine, but I don't know too much about it. So there have been a handful of uh, interventions that have shown that it does benefit uh, body composition and strength with resistance training. But these studies have pretty much exclusively been conducted by uh, the lab that creates it as a supplement and sells it. And so, and there's only a handful of them. So, I mean, it's one thing. It's a faith buy, is how I would classify it, because I wouldn't say the literature is strong enough to say, you know, yeah, it probably will benefit you, or yeah, it probably won't. I would say that 
the literature suggests it might benefit you with the caveat that there isn't a lot of research on it and all the literature that is available has conflicts of interest. Uh, so, you know, maybe. Uh, I don't know how expensive it is, though. And frankly, uh, given everything else we've discussed, it's like how much additional benefit is it going to provide if you have, you know, your protein and calories and resistance training routine dialed in. Um, yeah. it sounds, so it sounds like uh, maybe a summary of this is that the muscle growth is going to be something like 50% training, 30% protein, uh, 10% calories. I mean, maybe not 10% calories. If it's, uh, if you assume you're eating adequate calories, maybe 10% from eating a little bit more than that. And then like, uh, I think I'm up to, am I up to 80 or 90? I don't know. 5% creatine, 5% other stuff. And maybe those other things, nothing really stands out unless it's a limiting factor for you. Like maybe you need more carbs to fuel your workout performance, or maybe you need beta alanine or transdermal carnosine to, to, for acid buffering to get a better workout. But probably whatever that other 5%, that last 5% is probably something that feeds back into improving that 50% that's the workout. Does that, does that model sound kind of more or less the, uh, the right model? ish something like that yeah okay um zachary lehman says how should caffeine be cycled if being used to enhance weightlifting performance and or weight loss is there a difference for fast or slow metabolizers of caffeine that's a good question and i'm gonna have to think about that for a second okay Danny, you have thoughts on this? I, uh, I remember, I remember yeah. listening to someone on your podcast who was talking about caffeine timing. So caffeine, uh, in terms of cycling on and off caffeine, this is one that uh, for if someone's talking in the context of trying to desensitize themselves to the effects and therefore when they go back on it, they will have a better um, ergogenic response to it. Uh, this is one I've gone back and forth on and I actually wrote an article, I think, last year or maybe the year before, um, where I tried to look through some of uh, the literature looking on this. And there's at least, while there's some mixed um, views on it, there's certainly a decent amount to suggest that it may not be as important as people think to try and come off caffeine to resensitize. Um, so like a typical thing that would have been done in uh, endurance sport quite often is maybe a week or so out from a race, someone would stop consuming all caffeine and then use caffeine uh, sub, as a supplement on race day. Um, and it seems that even if you don't, so even if you become, uh, your caffeine tolerance builds up, so you even subjectively people will feel a lesser response to the caffeine. Even as that happens, you can still have the same ergogenic benefit in terms of performance impacts. Um, and so I'm less convinced than I was that it's actually necessary for someone to uh, cycle off caffeine to try and resensitize to then get a performance boost from using it. And I think a lot of the, the tolerance that they're building is more going to be around some of the other um, subjective symptoms or just how um, I don't know, jittery and stuff like that people feel in response to it as opposed to actually athletic performance because it seems that that can stay maintained even as someone's tolerance builds. Mm. But again, there is some conflicting stuff there and um, I'm open for uh, an alternate view in that because I, I know a lot of coaches will still do that and I know there is um, a good hypothesis as to why it would work. So that's generally what the cliff notes was of of uh, the last time I looked into that. Um, as for fast and slow metabolizers, um, the, the only thing, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at this, but the only thing I can think of is just, again, some of that subjective stuff of how they feel, um, how if someone is, um, if we're talking about athletic performance, I don't know for weightlifting how much a role this will play. It would probably be more of an issue for endurance of how they may split that caffeine across the whole race day. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure on their 
their, how they would metabolize it and what implications it would have practically in weightlifting. Again, I'd have to look into that a bit more, but there's some general thoughts. I don't know if that's, any of that's useful. Cool. Uh, Chad, did anything pop into your mind yet? Uh, I can't think of, uh, I don't think the slow and fast metabolizer would make a difference. Um, I'm trying to find a study. The, the uh, U.S. military did a study and they used mathematical models to determine um, what was going to be the best for like alertness and cognitive performance in soldiers. And they did identify the dosing strategy. So I'll look for that. And uh, when I find it, I'll let you know. Okay, cool. Um, Alex, you drink a lot of caffeine like I do. You got any thoughts? Uh yeah, so when you're cycling caffeine, you're going to need one to two weeks off to uh, resensitize adenosine receptors. Um, the effects of caffeine with regard to habitual use is that it doesn't matter how uh, sensitized you become to caffeine, it's still going to have an anti-fatigue effect. Uh, but it does begin to lose its benefits on cognitive performance and as a stimulant and uh, for endurance capacity, but it's all relative to how much you regularly use. So uh, caffeine's definitely been far more well investigated with endurance exercise than it has with uh, weightlifting performance. And the gist of those studies is that if, let's say you're a regular coffee drinker, so your baseline intake every day is like 200 milligrams, uh, you can still experience a benefit if you increase your intake up to 600 milligrams. Uh, but if you're regularly taking in 600 milligrams, what we don't know is that whether you'll experience a benefit if you increase and you take like 1200 milligrams um, because you have a higher baseline, but studies haven't looked at such high intake levels. So we don't know if it's just a matter of exceeding your baseline intake by a certain amount to experience the benefits or whether there is a point of no return where once you're habituated to a certain level, then nothing above that is going to have an effect. Um, that remains an unknown area. What we do know is that if you're regularly drinking like two bang energy drinks every day, that popping 600 milligrams of caffeine uh, isn't going to do anything for you. Um, it's not going to benefit your performance uh, once you become habituated to that high caffeine intake anyway. So if you're naturally just a low caffeine user, you can circumvent this issue by maintaining a usual caffeine intake of like 200 milligrams per day. And then it's as simple as just every other day or uh, two days off, one day on, going up to like 600 milligrams of caffeine. Um, for weightlifting, potentially, depending on what type of lifting schedule you would do, uh, my recommendation would probably be to save the caffeine, the high dose caffeine for the days where you really need to be able to exert a lot of power, uh, because it's going to make you feel more energized. It's going to boost your confidence. Uh, it can do a lot to benefit weightlifting performance, for example, on deadlifts, uh, potentially directly but more so indirectly by making you more uh, cognitively uh, ready to lift heavy weight. Um, you know, you can't really uh, undermine the effect that being in the right mindset can have where you feel confident, like you can lift that weight and everything. So, yeah. Yeah. I... What I've generally done uh, myself anecdotally is um, not not use caffeine except when I'm gonna trying to hit a PR and uh, and then increase my caffeine thirty percent over whatever I would usually be taking in during that time period and it seems to have worked although psychologically like I, I was just thinking like I can I can you know really like f bombs can add like. 10 or 20 pounds on the lift, like the psychological, uh, that would, that would be Danny, you're muted. Danny, you're muted. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say things like loud music as well. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. Data on that too. Um, loud, loud, violent music. Right. Yeah. <laughs> things that just came to mind because, uh, 
in the context of it, if this person is a competitive weightlifter that may be outside of kind of some of the physiological stuff, um, that may be a, a counter to why you might want to um, either restrict it the week of a, a meet, for example, or not. So one would be the potential placebo effect. And so if someone is used to having uh, caffeine and they have a kind of high tolerance for it, and then as they start to deload to a week out from a potential meat, and then they take caffeine um, out completely, and then when they have some caffeine on the day of the meat, and they they get a, a, that higher energized feel, and subjectively they feel more buzzed than usual because they're now a bit resensitized to it. That can potentially play some role. Uh, just as a placebo, even beyond some of the performance benefits. Um, the other kind of counter to that would be if someone is cutting weight for a weightlifting meat, there may be some advantage to allowing them to stay consuming caffeine as opposed to cut it out to try and resensitize. So one would be just if they're restricting uh, overall intake, um, some people just might find it less stressful to cut if they're allowed to have some caffeine as opposed to deal with caffeine withdrawal on, on top of a weight cut. And then secondly, caffeine may play a mild diuretic use as well. So if they're going to take some caffeine supplement during a uh, water restriction, for example, that may, again, to a small degree, but at least mechanistically, you can make an argument that it could play a role there. Um, so there are just two other things that are outside of performance benefits that just came to mind as, as you were talking. Cool. Um, really uh, quick, irrelevant anecdote on the fast, slow oxidizing thing, since we didn't really hit that part. Um, growing up, my mom always told me that I drank coffee wrong because she would drink two cups in the morning and I would drink one cup in the morning and one cup in the afternoon. She told me I should drink all my coffee in the morning because uh, it would keep me up at night and so on. And uh, then we got our 23 and me's tested. I came back as a, as a uh, fast oxidizer. My mom came back as a slow metabolizer. And uh, now, uh, now I have my defense. I don't drink coffee wrong. I just drink it in accordance with my genetic heritage, my genetic destiny. So, all right. Um, the, Nicholas Simpson has what I think is a, is a much uh, tougher question. I don't know if we can do anything on it, but let's throw it out there. Is there any evidence to how supplements intended to increase nitric oxide, such as citrulline, arginine, and nitrates, might influence protein S nitrosylation and nitrosative stress in the muscle? Or more generally, is there any evidence that when improvements in endurance occur, that it might be from reducing the capacity to spend energy at a high rate versus the more common idea of improved blood flow? I have to read the second part a second time to understand. Okay. Is there any evidence that when improvements in endurance occur from these nitric oxide donating or increasing supplements, that it might be from reducing the capacity? So I think what, so I think what he's saying is that um, proteins can be modified by adding nitric oxide to them. That's called S nitrosylation. And that can turn them on or off. You probably usually inhibit them. And he's saying maybe these supplements are um, decreasing an energy expenditure at a high rate. Um, I don't. I don't know why that would improve. Oh, I see. He's saying maybe that would improve endurance because you have a more steady supply of energy. Um, maybe you have better endurance if you don't waste all your energy in one shot. Um, and then he adds a parenthetical note that I think is why he, his sort of motivation for asking the question in muscular dystrophy research, there are some insights into the impacts of dysregulated nitric oxide signaling with, um, NOS, Nick, N -NOS, I think that might be a typo associated with the dystrophin protein and delocalized when that protein is damaged or absent, leading to hypernitrosylation and reduction of function of muscle proteins, such as the ryanidine receptor and circuit channels, which contribute to energy intensive ion exchange and are related to the fast twitch properties. Anyone have, uh, any, anyone ha want to take a stab at this? Well, I, I would say one thing in terms of the second part about, um, during 
higher intensity or during any type of exercise, those playing a role in, in uh, limiting fatigue, so to speak, for for lack of a, a better word, um, that's not that may play a role, but the not delivering enough oxygen to the muscle is not really ever an issue during exercise. When there's a change in interstitial pH, the body will parasympathetically limit blood flow. So you can limit nutrient, limit oxygen, limit ATP um, in the exercising muscle, but that's solely regulated by interstitial pH. So if those, if those things uh, with NO are, are playing a role, it, it would not influence the end result if, if there's a change in pH. So it wouldn't make a difference. So if you have that change in interstitial pH, it's going to limit blood flow and it wouldn't, you know, so that's not necessarily directly related, but also is the mechanism that's responsible for limiting blood flow. It wouldn't be related to the, to those. So you're, so you're, you're addressing this in the perspective that the nitric oxide is, is primarily going to be affecting blood flow, right? Correct. Yeah. It's going to affect blood flow, but that, that's not, that's not ever really going to be uh, a rate limiting factor f- during um, exercise or intense exercise. It's interstitial pH. Well, yeah, I think he's, he's getting at a, um, and so I, 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 I apologize to, uh, to Nicholas. I, um, I wasn't familiar with the N NOS abbreviation N is neuronal um, nitric oxide synthase. And he's taking some analogy from, um, from neuronal research. And I just think there's probably zero research in this area. And he's just kind of crossing disciplines with this idea, but he, I, he's speculating that maybe inside the cell that the nitric oxide, um, is, is rather than affecting blood flow outside the cell, that it might be having a regulatory function inside the cell by altering um, the protein. So if there's proteins directly involved in producing energy that can be nitrosylated, then they would slow down. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my guess is that there's, there isn't any research on this, um, but, uh, but it's an interesting idea. Um, anyone else want to throw anything out there on this question? I don't have anything on this. I just find it an interesting thought process though, to follow. I like what he, uh, yeah. the, the question, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think I can actually add. Yeah. I mean, I, I, so I've come across this, um, I have to say that like nitrosylation of proteins is a fairly obscure, um, thing. Like, uh, when I was, when I was in grad school, uh, it, it came up because our lab kind of specialized in, in these things. But also, like if you really, really, really study a protein, um, you might you might realize that the, this protein is like ADP ribosylated and nitrosylated and succinylated and and uh, and like these things are, don't really make them out into the, the standard literature on a on a topic. Um, uh, in part because a lot of the modifications to proteins, you know, like there's, there's a handful of things that are really well understood, like, uh, like phosphorylation is, is like super textbook. Right. And so if something's phosphorylated or not, like you're probably going to know about it if you're t- tangentially related to that field, if something is like nitrosylated or ADP ribosylated or succinylated or something like that, you're probably going to have to like really be digging into the liter the primary literature on that specific protein to have any clue about that. Um, and so I think this is like a very, very interesting, very obscure, probably not even under-researched, but unresearched topic. Um, I mean, my, if I had to throw, it's probably unfair to like throw a judgment out on this, but if I were to throw one out based on my imagination, um, I think that, uh, I, I think that, uh, like generally, um, it's probably going to hurt generally if, if these, if the proteins involved in energy metabolism are being modified to slow them down, um, it's probably going to be bad for performance because it's, that's probably an indication of stress that is being caused by burning energy. Right. So like, um, 
and maybe Chad can can correct me if I'm misunderstanding a point on, on pH, but um, but like if you have lactate accumulating in the cell, you're going to slow down glycolysis um, in the muscle based on pH regulation because the cell is perceiving that burning energy in general right now is too stressful or, or more specifically that generating lactate in glycolysis is too stressful. Um, but it's, it's sort of like when you've reached the point in the cell that you are deciding to slow down the energy burning rate because uh, it's usually because um, it's causing stress to burn that amount of energy. And that's probably going to be negative for, for endurance or high intensity over the long term, unless you're adapting to it in a way that is getting rid of that regulation. That would be my impression. Chad, what, what do you think about that using pH as an analogy? Do you think that's a fair way of characterizing pH response? Um, well, I mean, generally, yes, but I, I think you would have to also consider intensity because you know, right. if, if you're anaerobic, you're not going to run into that scenario where you are having to slow down because of issues with energy um, within the cell. I, I think you're going to run out of anaerobic capacity before you run out of um, the potential to utilize any of the cellular uh, activity. So if, if, you're, if you're talking anaerobic, this probably doesn't even apply at all. It, once you drop back into aerobic glycolysis, then everything that you're talking about would apply for sure. Uh, okay. And so then, and you're, and so if you get to that point where you're slowing glycolysis, you are probably, you're probably not going to have better endurance. No, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to, that would, you would only think that would limit ATP production, yeah. right? And resynthesis. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Lee W says, and this is, uh, Lee had brought this question up last time and I didn't have a, a whole lot. And so I, I told Lee to, um, bring it back here and maybe you guys could, could chime in on this better than I could. So Lee's having problems with delayed onset muscle soreness and overall poor soft tissue quality and is wondering what to, you know, so my initial reaction was, um, you know, like generally DOMS uh, is, is a matter of uh, getting used to the workout and resting and refeeding enough. Um, but for someone who seems to be chronically experiencing more DOMS, than they should. Um, Lee's experimenting with glutamine and collagen. Are there any other suggestions about what to do about that besides just more obvious comments on resting and recovering? Yeah, I got a couple things. I've actually been studying this quite in depth. We've got a, I got a study right now that's in the K in, um, in IRB and Actually, in, we started off researching delayed onset muscle soreness with the transdermal carnosine gel product I told you about because the athletes were always coming back to us and saying, hey, I'm not sore. I can train at a higher level every day. So we, were, we wanted to investigate why, what was the mechanism. And so we had to first identify you know, what, what was it that was causing DOMS. We felt comfortable on interstitial glutamate being the cause for the dendrite pain feedback loops. And so when we looked at that, we kind of said, hey, you know, this sounds a lot like fibromyalgia. Um, and indeed, when we studied uh, fibromyalgia patients, we found they had increased interstitial glutamate concentrations. Uh, what I would say based on all of this research is that somebody that's experiencing DOMS on a regular basis is not experiencing DOMS on a regular basis. That sounds more like a pathology um, because you really can't have DOMS on a regular basis. Mm. It sounds more like a fibromyalgia or some other type of chronic pain state. Uh, what I would say is that should probably be investigated further by medical professionals. Um, uh, with that being said, if that is investigated or not, what we uh, used in both a delayed onset muscle soreness study where we induced DOMS by uh, having people run downhill and what we are also u utilizing in, we also have a fibromyalgia study um, right now that's recruiting, is we are using that uh, transdermal carnosine gel. Carnosine obliterates interstitial glutamate, um, and that is why the athletes were experiencing less DOM. So I would highly recommend either uh, supplementing with beta alanine or look at getting the, uh, the transdermal carnosine gel we use, the Lactigo, uh, uh, to help with that because that is not a normal... Uh, uh, 
condition to be finding yourself in regularly if your resistance uh, training on a regular basis, even recreationally, you should still be experiencing DOMS. The, I have a couple follow-up questions on that. First of all, the transdermal carnosine, uh, does that have to be uh, applied up dur before and or during the workout, or can that be applied after the fact to get rid of DOMS that is already there? Um, you could do either. Um, with the fibromyalgia patients, we have them, the half-life is, is around four hours. Um, so we have the fibromyalgia patients putting it on four times a day. Uh, you can, but the way we use it in and around exercise is before and after. So I, I wouldn't see any disadvantage to introducing um, carnosine into the system um, at any point in the day, but before and after training, definitely after training though. Is, is that meant to reach the blood or does it have to be applied to the specific area to infuse it into the muscle? It's designed to go directly into the muscle. We're actually, we have a one HMRS study in the works where we're going to determine a specific percentage that goes into the actual muscle and um, what percentage makes it into plasma because there is definitely going to be some that reaches plasma, but it's, it's designed to, to go directly into the muscle itself. And then finally, I think I might have a, maybe I have a um, incomplete understanding of the neurotransmitters here, but um, I, I thought, I thought glutamate, if you're contracting muscle, I thought glutamate would be like in the spinal cord and acetylcholine would be at the, uh, at the end plate stimulating the muscle to contract. Where is the interstitial glutamate and how's it getting there? Um, in terms of how it's getting there, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't actually looked Where at Where is it? Is this interstitial in the muscle? Yes. It, it'll be in the interstitial space is where we find the, the glutamate concentrations in both, um, with both in DOMS and also in fibromyalgia. It's just more predictable and higher concentrations. Um, and usually with, with DOMS, it will, will require um, higher blood flow to the muscle to have an increase in interstitial glutamate, which obviously will happen during training. Uh, with fibromyalgia patients, they have increased interstitial glutamate um, at baseline regardless of blood flow. Have you, um, have you tested glutamine or ammonia? Is, the, is it possible that the glutamine is being hydrolyzed to, for ammonia to buffer acid? So, uh, sure. I mean, we, that's not something that we have looked at, but I mean, that, that certainly would make sense. It's, yeah, so I know I know in the kidney the um, the overwhelming governor of glutamine hydrolysis is the, is pH to use ammonia as an acid buffer, and for myself, um, I, and I, I still haven't tried beta alanine or transdermal carnosine, and I, I'm highly motivated to try it now because I, I think that my issues are very well managed, but but could uh, be but could always be turned up a notch, but. Um, when I had a, a, a health crisis that um, was, uh, I believe the causes were very high barium levels and um, and a mold indoor mold issue. Um, but I symptomatically I had a very persistent, very terrible cutaneous fungal infection, and I also um, even when that started clearing up, I I couldn't work out more than once every five days. And I would be, DOMS wasn't really a problem for me, but uh, I was just uh, floored in bed. Like I just, I'd work out and I'd just lay in bed for three hours because I couldn't do anything else. And then I wouldn't feel like I could work out again for about five uh, days. And the turning point for me was when I got a Genova ion panel, which is plasma amino acids and urinary organic acids. And the only abnormality on it was that my glutamate to glutamine ratio in my urine or no, in my plasma was really, 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 really high. And so I, I, I just thought through all of the possible things that could cause that. Um, and I decided that it was probably from acid stress. And I started measuring the pH in my urine and it was really, really acidic and it would working out would make it go like really, really, really acidic. So like maybe I'd wake up and it would be like five or 4.5 and it, I'd work out and it would go down to like three or something like that. And um, so I started experimenting with bicarbonate dosing 
uh, just because that was more obvious and I didn't really know about the beta alanine and I certainly didn't know about the transdermal carnosine. Uh, so I started supplementing with bicarbonate and I did, started doing a dosing program to see how much I needed to take on a regular basis and to compensate for my workout. And the first day where I hit a turning point, um, I did a workout and I was floored in bed and I, I just didn't feel like I could do anything. And I, every time I got up I'd, 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 to pee, I would pee and measure my urine pH and I'd add another quarter teaspoon of bicarbonate to try to figure out where I should be dosing it. And at, after about four or five times of this, I, uh, I suddenly felt like I immediately just wanted to jump out of bed and start working. I felt amazing. And I went and I measured my urine pH and it was the first time that my urine pH crossed over six <laughs> and it, it lined up. It wasn't going anywhere with repeating dosing of bicarbonate for uh, like uh, for a while. Um, and it, it just it crossed so perfectly with normalizing the urine pH that I just used that as a model to, um, to, to make a regular dosing regimen, which I, I don't do any longer uh, because I fixed some other things. But, uh, but at the time, that was the thing that allowed me to start working out normally, um, you know, th three, three to five times a week. And, uh, and it was, it was like night and day for me. Um, and so it's an interesting connection that the thing that made me realize that was the high glutamate levels, which I took as an indicator of, of um, acid, uh, buffering stress. Um, so it'd be interesting uh, to see if the source of the interstitial glutamate there is, you know, I imagine my interstitial glutamate was really high at this point because it was really high in my plasma. <laughs> um, so that, 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 that's interesting. Uh, cause the glutamate shouldn't be a neurotransmitter in the muscles, right? No, it's, a, it's, uh, it's neurotoxic in high concentrations. So yeah. that's the, that's the issue is that it becomes, Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, so I see. So, you're, so even, even though, so like acetylcholine is a normal, uh, excitatory neurotransmitter at the neuromotor end plate, but if, but there are glutamate receptors there. And if you have high interstitial glutamate, you can, or there are glutamate receptors, there are glutamate receptors on the neuron. Um, yes. and, and so you can have excitotoxicity at the neuron at, at the at the level of the neuron because of that glutamate, even if that glutamate is released as as like glutamine hydrolysis for some non neurotransmitter function, is that exactly? Yeah, it just has to be in really high concentrations. Like, obviously, it's present, you know, regularly, but when it's in excessive concentrations, it becomes neurotoxic. Got it. Causes okay. excito it causes excitotoxicity, like you said. Right. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, well, not well. Cool to have a a model of dealing, <laughs> dealing with that. Um, Marcus Matthiasen says, what do you recommend for maximizing muscle growth and optimizing performance on a low protein diet, less than 1.2 grams per kilogram per bo body weight? So I, I guess, um, I get, I, I think this is a valuable question because, uh, although the initial gut reaction might be, uh, get rid of the low protein diet. Um, there are, there are people who are going to eat a low protein diet and there's some people who need to eat a low protein diet. For example, like someone with a urea cycle defect who wants to gain muscle, um, who may medically have to restrict protein or other people who are just more obsessed with, I shouldn't say obsessed, but just more prioritizing what they believe are longevity or cancer prevention effects of eating lower protein or whatever, whether those are true or not. Um, is there anything someone can do given a suboptimal protein intake to compensate for that? So just a couple of immediate things that I thought of as I um, heard that question. So uh, the first few are ones that we've already mentioned so far. So we're presuming that someone's training stimulus is adequate. And again, that's going to be the primary driver of muscle growth anyway. Um, and again, looking at overall energy, uh, it's going to probably be more ideal to be eucaloric or hypercaloric um, rather than in a hypocaloric condition. So presuming that the other thing with, if uh, the first thing I was going to say is if we're presuming a lower total daily protein intake, I think one of the 
big things with protein intake in general is that if we're looking at this from a perspective of maximizing muscle protein synthesis, then the muscle per meal dose and then the, the distribution, therefore, it plays a large role. So even at something like 1.2 grams per kilo or below, you can still have the opportunity to have probably, um, at, uh, probably at least three um, or probably around three um, high per meal doses of protein. So if you're taking that to be 0.4 grams per kilo as a per meal dose, that's going to almost certainly maximize the MPS response in that per meal. So if you're getting three of those split across the day, you can probably stay within that 1.2 um, gram per kilo. Um, and even if, if it's a bit below that 0.4, if it's uh, if someone is hypercaloric, probably anything above 0.25 grams per kilo is a high per meal dose. Now, saying that, if the hypothetical individual is in the case that you mentioned, Chris, of uh, looking at this from a longevity standpoint, they may also be worried about the per meal dose and um, trying to, uh, or having a high amount of leucine per meal. And so if they're doing that, that kind of puts that, uh, per meal recommendation I mentioned out the window. Um, but if not, that's the way I would kind of go. If your overall intake has to be lower, you can probably still get a decent amount of benefit just from how you distribute that protein over the day and trying to have probably higher bolus doses to, to meet those requirements um, around three times if possible. Um, that was the first thing that came to mind. And I'm sure there's others were missing out on, but Again, it depends on if we're talking about does someone want to keep that per meal dose low as well for fear of, of what that may do longevity wise. Um, although I would argue that the, uh, let's say, uh, the hypothetical threshold for how much leucine per meal you could have where it starts to become a negative is actually probably a lot higher than, than that anyway. Um, and like anything under, let's say, five grams of leucine is probably still going to be fine, even if someone is worried about longevity. But that's uh, the first things that came to mind, but I'll let the two guys jump in if they have anything else to add. Cool. Uh, looks like we lost Chad momentarily. Alex, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. yeah. So I'll jump on the, the tail of Danny here and mention that uh, if you're eating a low protein intake below 1.2 grams per kilogram, then you're probably going to be best served with two things. Uh, the first is making sure that almost all of your protein is coming from very high quality bioavailable sources, uh, basically animal products. So uh, dairy, eggs, and meats. Uh, so that way you're getting the best return on your investment for um, the protein you are getting. Uh, second to that, I would add that consuming, you're probably going to have to limit your protein consumption to being uh, two to three meals so that you can get at least 0.4 grams per kilogram uh, in each meal. And the reason for that is uh, part of this will depend on your age. So if you're an older adult, you're going to require more protein per meal than younger adults simply because you are less sensitive to the anabolic effects of protein. Uh, it's uh, an effect called the sarcopenia, or I'm sorry, uh, anabolic resistance of aging. And it's one of the things that leads to sarcopenia with aging, which is uh, the age-related loss of muscle mass. Um, but for, if for whatever reason that's not working for you, or if for whatever reason you can't eat higher quality sources of protein, then your best bet is going to be to add some free leucine to every meal that you do consume. Because as I mentioned in a question earlier, uh, we have data showing that adding high doses like five grams of pure leucine to an otherwise low protein meal can help increase the muscle protein synthetic response, similar to if you ate a higher dose of a complete protein. Um, and this somewhat circumvents uh, the other issue I raised earlier about BCAAs. Because you're not in a fasted state, you're still getting protein. You're still getting other essential amino acids. It's just that uh, you're not getting as high of a muscle protein synthesis boost as you would if you had ate a more complete protein from the get-go. So you add in the leucine to compensate for that, and then you're good to go just as if you'd had like a whey protein shake. 
Uh, so those are the two things I would do. Um, I would probably eat two to three meals a day and supplement them with leucine if required. Uh, if you're eating a low protein diet that is coming primarily from plant proteins, then you're also going to need to pay attention to combining the plant proteins to make sure that you're overcoming the limiting amino acids within them. Uh, again, proteins require 20 amino acids to be synthesized and plants are usually deficient in uh, at least one of the essential amino acids. For example, lysine is very commonly uh, deficient in legumes, um, but some grains provide it, uh, whereas grains are lower in methionine that can be provided by legumes. And so when you combine the two, they can make up for one another a little bit. Um, it's still not as good as consuming highly bioavailable protein sources from animal products. But, uh, you know, you got to do the best that you can within the circumstances that you're in. Yeah, it's, I mean, the way that I would think about it would be um, probably the focusing on the anabolic stimulus would be um, hugely beneficial, both because that's as Danny mentioned is, is such the overwhelming driver, but also because, um, you don't break, like, it depends why you're eating low protein, right? But you don't break down. Well, I, for almost any purpose, if you're driving protein into muscle, then you're driving it out, out of whatever other pathways you might be trying to minimize with a lower protein intake, whether it's not stressing the urea cycle or it's, um, I mean, I, there, I don't know if there's any research on this, but I would think that if there were any effect on uh, fueling cancer growth or something like that, like uh, if you're driving protein into muscle, then um, you're driving it away from fueling the growth of uh, and any, anything else, I would think. Um, there's a protein, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, there's a protein, let me see if I can pull it up. There's an amino acid um, product called the master amino acid pattern. Uh, I looked at their research and I, I was it didn't seem terribly compelling, uh, but they claim that they for, and actually I think their ratio is proprietary. But they claim that they um, put together the exact ratio of amino acids needed to um, to maximally divert the protein into muscle protein synthesis. Um, regardless of the legitimacy of the product, uh, I think it kind of, that kind of gets at the point that Alex was making that um, you, don't, you don't want low quality protein if you're, especially if you're thinking of like um, stressing nitrogen metabolism, because uh, if you have higher quality protein that's better designed to support muscle growth, that's less protein that you need to consume and metabolize in order to get a given amount of muscle growth. So it seems like you'd want like higher biological quality would be better. Um, all right. Laura Leet says, I wanted to know the best timing to take. Uh, this looks like it's aimed at me. I wanted to know the best timing to take true niogen, nicotinamide riboside and TMG trimethylglycine, especially with the purpose of increasing exercise tolerance. Exercise triggers autoimmune symptoms the next day, headache and nausea. Background, exercise sessions are great, strength gain, gains are occurring. Any other thoughts? Um, she's also taking creatine and beta-hydroxymethylbutyrate monohydrate. Um, I think at least the NR and, and TMG is aimed at me, but I think the, there's a more general question here about the exercise triggering headache and nausea. Um, so, uh, so I, since I've I've kind of written and spoken a bit about the NR and the TMG, um, I don't think the timing matters. Your the it, it, to the extent that helps with exercise tolerance, you're trying to um, to increase NAD uh, in the muscle, and that's uh, if timing matters, it's to spread it out and to take it with meals. And the timing of the TMG is to um, remove 
uh, is to make up for, for methyl donors that might be lost. So I would take the TMG at the same time as the NR. I would spread the NR evenly across meals and I to support exercise tolerance. Um, more generally, guys, do you have any thoughts on this issue of exercise sessions appear to be going great, but the next day she gets headache and nausea, which she says are autoimmune symptoms, but that seems to me like uh, an interpretation imposed on this much more general issue of she gets headache and nausea the day after she exercises. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I personally don't have anything on that. There's nothing that comes to mind, especially if it's autoimmune related. I wouldn't, um, there's nothing that's coming to mind that I could connect there. Okay. Alex, maybe? No. Uh, outside my wheelhouse. Okay. Um, Zachary that- Lehman says, when dieting, at what point do refeeds become helpful to actually increase the rate of weight loss? Are refeeds less useful while at higher body fat levels? What is a reasonable caloric surplus for a refeed? Um, so th- the first few things I'll say here is that there's probably not uh, an exact quantification we can give for some of this stuff, um, particularly because a lot of the recommendations are going to come from anecdotally what have been done uh, by coaches in practice and then trying to piece together stuff mechanistically as opposed to being researched directly. Um, the other is about terminology of what different people refer to as a refeed and what time scale that is. So most commonly people may look at a one day or two day refeed, um, but that can obviously be a bit longer. You can then get into the area of diet breaks, which can be one to two weeks um, and so on. So presuming someone we're talking about like an acute refeed of like a few days, um, I think rather than thinking of it as the refeed itself accelerating the rate of weight loss uh, by that increase in calories or putting someone into a slight surplus, it's probably more likely to think of it in that acute moment. It's like kind of hitting pause on the rate of fat loss, but it's just setting you up for better continued success. So you might want to do that as someone has uh, even from the psychological side, a buildup of dieting fatigue, let's say, and they've been doing it for a prolonged period of time. And just that ability to have more energy, to be able to recover a bit better for a few days, to have a bit more food flexibility in terms of their choices, um, and a few higher days of uh, calories may then allow them to continue to adhere to that diet better going forward. It may allow them for the few days after the refeed to get better quality workouts if they've been lagging and so on. So it's really a method to kind of set someone up for uh, continued better quality training, like I said, but probably more so psychologically, I think it's going to have more of a benefit. Um, Some of the proposed mechanisms people may point to have been around if you use a refeed to uh, boost up levels of leptin, for example, or boost metabolic rate. And the problem with with those things, first on just generally boosting energy expenditure, um, the amount that you're actually increasing your intake almost wipes out the increase you're going to see in, say, resting metabolic rate um, and non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And then um, for the perspective of leptin, you could argue how much is a benefit of an acute spike over a day if that leptin level is going to drop back down. Um, afterwards once that person decreases calories again um, because that change in leptin is going to happen. There's going to be an acute change in response to caloric intake quite quickly. And then the decrease someone's had in their leptin levels just from losing body fat, that's going to be maintained. So um, how much of a benefit that's actually going to have from a one to two day refeed is, is kind of questionable. So that's the way I tend to think of refeeds, that it's more of Uh, practically allowing someone to continue doing that dieting phase for a longer period of time, being able to continue putting in uh, good quality training over time, and then just increasing their uh, compliance with the diet over time. Um, So that's typically where they do it. 
uh, I think from an anecdotal perspective, to get to your final two questions, it does seem that the leaner an individual gets, that the frequency of the refeeds uh, being increased would be more productive. So if someone has a lot of body fat to lose, they may not need refeeds for uh, at all for a significant period of time. Um, versus as someone gets very lean, let's say they're doing a, a bodybuilding contest prep. Um, and as they start to get down to very lean levels, then having more regular refeeds where you're bringing their caloric intake back up uh, may be more beneficial uh, for a multitude of reasons which we can get into. And then in terms of the final question, the reasonable caloric surplus, um, it probably doesn't have to be that large. And in many, depending on the strategy, so like I mentioned before, the, if you have a longer time course, like you're doing a diet break for a week, you may decide to bring their calories to a maintenance level with no surplus. If it's for a run of multiple days, same thing, you might do three days a week where you bring them to a maintenance level and go a bit more aggressive of a deficit on the other days. But if it's just a one day kind of refeed thing, uh, then you that person can obviously go into a refeed, but it depends on how someone's going to structure it. There's just a million different ways logistically to do that. Um, and again, pragmatically, you may try and marry up a refeed with what someone has going on in their life at that time point. So they've been dieting for a while and they have a social occasion coming up next weekend. You may push the diet a bit more aggressively um, in the lead up and then use a kind of weekend refeed, so to speak, just to allow them more calories to be able to go out to, to dinner or go to a party and so on and still can feel like they're, they're continuing to make progress. So uh, they're, they're the things that came to mind there, but I'm happy to get into more details if there's any follow-up. Alex, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I don't think I really need to add anything to that. It was a good answer. Uh, perhaps I would also just add in that the refeed isn't necessarily going to relate to the rate of weight loss, but it's just going to relate to uh, psychological health and possibly weight loss to maintenance. Uh, we do have some data showing intermittent dieting. Uh, it does a better job than chronic caloric restriction at maintaining a basal metabolic rate and helping prevent some of the adaptive declines in energy expenditure that occur when you're going through the weight loss uh, program. So, you know, there's a lot of theoretical benefits of that because when you're dieting, the body is going to try to conserve as much energy as it can. And so what it'll do is it'll make it more difficult to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. It will uh, compromise immune function somewhat. Um, and we can counter these by doing forms of intermittent dieting where you might you know, go hard for five days out of the week and then eat at maintenance or in a, a surplus over the weekend and then go hard for five days again. Uh, or at you know different rates depending on preference and current body composition. All right, cool. Uh, we have eight minutes left, and we have a handful of questions. So I'm just going to ask that uh, that no more questions are submitted, so we can try to get through what we have. Um, all right, Reinhard Innerhofer says. For increasing endurance performance, what about combining fasting and sirtuin activating compounds like resveratrol or AMPK activators like berberine, metformin, curcumin, quercetin, EGCG, or alpha-lipoic acid when training? Do you think this could meaningfully increase the effects on mitochondrial biogenesis and endurance performance compared to without fasting and active compounds? I guess this is a follow-up to his previous question where um, I had kind of said that I wouldn't focus on the um the the pathways as much as the overall things and so he's basically breaking us down to a strategy if you're trying to increase endurance performance um do you do you train fasted with uh with with compounds that are going to activate mitochondrial biogenesis um or or uh do those have practical advantages versus not adding those compounds to training fasted and is training fasted important in that, in the endurance perspective? Mm. 
Um, so before getting to some of the, those compounds, I think going along the lines of how he's thinking of uh, how each of them, the different pathways they would affect, you can look at that from also a training and nutrition perspective of what we mentioned earlier around carbohydrate periodization, the area of research looking at low glycogen availability training. So purposely doing some training sessions either with a low level of glycogen um, and or low levels of carbohydrate feeding or even beyond that, low amounts of carbohydrate post-training, so not using it in the recovery window. And so colloquially, you will hear that referring to as train low strategies or recover low strategies if it's carbohydrate restriction during the recovery window. Um, and a kind of subset of that being sleep low strategies where the athlete will do a training session, not have any carbohydrate afterwards, maybe just some protein, sleep overnight, and then only the next day have some carbohydrates. And the idea behind all of those strategies being that you see changes um, in things you mentioned earlier, mitochondrial biogenesis uh, speaks to this question being one of those. Um, and you see certain benefits at the level of the muscle when you uh, train and or recover with carbohydrate restriction and or low levels of glycogen. And so uh, the idea of carbohydrate periodization for those endurance athletes being you're trying to get the best of both worlds. You know that carbohydrates are going to drive better performance, but you also are trying to get some of these physiological changes that we see when someone has carbohydrate restriction. So the way you'd set that up is um, earmark certain training sessions where the performance doesn't matter so much. So that could be like a light recovery run. It could be um, some sort of work that someone's doing on the track, but it doesn't matter how they actually perform per se. And during those, you can go into them with low levels of glycogen. Um, maybe the previous session you would have restricted carbohydrate or you've done a low carbohydrate day up to that point, for example, and then go into the priority training sessions where your performance does matter or you're already trying to push performance with high levels of carbohydrate. And then obviously in the event itself have high glycogen and high carbohydrate feeding too. So those strategies are the same thing. I think that the, we're talking about here of trying to target certain pathways to uh, lead to increased mitochondrial biogenesis. So I think from a nutritional point uh, and training perspective, marrying those up seems to have benefit, at least mechanistically. Um, in terms of the p carbohydrate periodization on performance as an endpoint, it seems to be still quite mixed. So I think we've probably have about... Um, seven-ish like good quality studies that, that at least I've, I've seen um, directly looking at that question. And you kind of see that maybe um, there's three where you see a benefit, four where it's kind of neutral and then none where there's a decrease. Um, but mechanistically, it still makes some sense. So I would think that if uh, some of these compounds are probably going to act in the same way, but maybe not with the same magnitude, that's what I would worry about. But it's interesting to think. I just don't know if, if there's an answer I can kind of quantify of how much of an impact it would have. But I, I get the line of thinking. And I think the reason why I bring up the carbohydrate periodization, I think that's uh, whilst completely different is at least some way a precedent that you can try and uh, use strategies to impact these kind of pathways and, and therefore in the long run get performance benefits. Um, but as to the Oh, Danny, you got muted. Oh, sorry. I was just going to finish up oh, okay. by saying, yeah. I think the specific compounds, one of uh, you guys might be able to go into a bit more detail. Cool. Alex, do you have anything to add? Um, not, not really, no. Uh, I think what's important to realize is that if your goal is increasing endurance performance, uh, you do not want to be training fasted and using these compounds for a good chunk of your training because any... Uh, logical training program to improve endurance performance is going to have high intensity and even moderate intensity workout sessions and those demand glucose. Uh, you want to be able to push your body as hard as you can go and you cannot do that without glucose and glycogen availability. It's just not physiologically possible. Uh, so during the parts of your training session where the intensity is lower, uh, probably around 60 
to 65% of your VO2 max and where you can run for longer periods of time, uh, such as like go for runs that are, you know, over an hour long. Uh, then training in a low glycogen state and using these compounds to try and boost the uh, hormetic stress on the mitochondria could be of benefit to um, obtain more of a kickback when you uh, enter into the recovery phase and the mitochondria do uh, adapt to become stronger and more able to handle that load. Um, but definitely don't do this during the parts of your training where you're going to be at an intensity above 70% of VO2 max because that's when you're going to require glucose if you want to uh, push yourself and actually pressure the body to adapt so that you can perform at higher intensities. Do you think there's any value to um, to training low during those times where you depend on glucose to either try to train your body to better tap into limited glycogen stores um, or to try to to um, create a better aerobic response because part of the part of what determines aerobic or not aerobic is going to be just how good are you at delivering oxygen to the tissue and adapting that oxygen supply very rapidly and deloading it and, and so on. Um, so, so do you think there's, do you think there's any, any value to doing part of that training of where you would expect to need a lot of glucose in low glucose, glucose supply, supply to, try to better, better uh, train, train the body? body that glucose glucose there? There? No. Uh, because the aerobic capacity is pretty much irrelevant for most um, endurance sport events. Uh, for example, even competitive marathon runners where they're going 26 miles have a RER that's close to 1.0, indicating a near exclusive reliance on glucose. Uh, when you're looking at a 5K, fat uh, oxidation is completely irrelevant. You give athletes high doses of niacin and have them run a 5K where fatty acid supply and oxidation is shut off because of the high dose niacin and their performance is not altered uh, because carbohydrates are the predominant fuel. It's not so much at these intensities, whether or not you can supply oxygen, it's uh, how much energy the cells need at a given moment. And glucose uh, can produce about two and a half times more ATP per minute than fat can when you're operating at these higher intensities. Um, and so when your cells, it's, it's as if like, uh, if you didn't have glucose available, let's say your highest intensity was 100. So you could literally be pushing that 100 and feeling like you're working really, really hard. But if you had the glucose available, then your highest intensity would be 120. And so you would be able to literally go at a higher intensity and have better performance with the glucose available. Yeah. yeah. So uh, now that I, I don't know if there's studies on the physiology in the, in the specific context that you're um, describing, but if I try to match it to what I do know about the physiology, I don't think that I, I would have thought through this uh, as clearly um, until now is uh, one of the benefits of burning glucose is that the contractile proteins of muscle are in the cytosol where glycolysis takes place, not in the mitochondria. And the ATP that's generated by glycolysis is at the immediate site of muscle contraction. And so, um, and so there's, there's a proximity effect where the ATP generated there does not have to travel any meaningful distance to directly supply the muscle versus the traveling of the mitochondria. In fact, in traversing the cell back and forth to the mitochondria is hugely significant. And, and the, one of the main reasons why creatine is so important in muscle strength is the fact that uh, creatine can diffuse back to the mitochondria 2,000 times faster than ATP can. And so most ATP... Um, is going to be recycled not by going back to the mitochondria and coming back to the muscle contractile protein, but by directly taking nearby creatine phosphate and having, if needed, the creatine shuttle back to the mitochondria, which is much faster. But not having to shuttle at all because of glycolysis is the fastest. 
but you can only generate two ATP by glycolysis out of net 30 to 32 ATP from completely burning the glucose. And so one of the, usually when discussed, when the physiology is discussed about why glycolysis is so important, you'd point out that if you just generate the two ATP real quick, generate lactate, lactate goes to the liver, comes back as glucose, keep doing that over and over and over again, you can generate that quick uh, ATP. But generating lactate from the glucose anaerobically has a cost to it, which is that uh, it's number one, that's a lot of traveling that you have to do to go back to the liver and come back. And number two, the lactate is acidic. And if you don't push it out of the muscle cell fast enough, glycolysis is going to be inhibited by the low pH. And none of that, like what's faster to completely oxidize that glucose uh, right in the muscle cell or to send it off, send, make lactate risk the low pH, send the lactate to the liver, have it come back as glucose and do that all over again. If you just bur completely oxidize the glucose, you eliminate the low pH risk and you eliminate the time needed to cycle things in the Cori cycle. Um, and so if you're faced with the, uh, if you, if you're basically faced with the demand that you must make the fast ATP and glycolysis, the question is for the rest of your ATP, are you, are you going to use fatty acids or are you going to use glucose? And there's going to be uh, in an ideal world, you might burn ev burn the whole house down and ac access everything, right? But with a with some limited supply of oxygen, uh, there's going to be a lot of and probably this 5K that you're talking about is one of these situations where to burn the fatty acids for the bulk of the ATP requirement and you also get the quick ATP from glycolysis requires that you make lactate and risk low pH and send the lactate down to the liver because you have said in your mitochondria, instead of fully oxidizing the glucose, I'm going to burn fatty acids. And so if you can get away with just fully oxidizing the glucose right there, given that you have enough glycogen to do that, then your choice would be to do that so that you don't have to risk the low lactate. Uh, I mean, the low pH from the lactate and the and the traveling time from the lactate. Whereas in something real quick, like maybe on a on a PR in a twelve rep squat or something like that, or you know something where you where you get past needing creatine, um, you you will risk that lactate uh, because the long term consequences of acid accumulation aren't your main concern. Your main concern right here is just burn the hell out of that glucose as fast as humanly possible, then rest and recover for the next set. And you can clear everything and, and go on. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. Just physiological rant there. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay. We are out of time here. I'm going to, I'm going to run down like a 10 second response to each of the remaining questions. If you guys uh, want to object to anything I say, then jump in. Uh, but I'm just going to try to acknowledge everyone and clear it out. So ideal training stimulus for muscle protein synthesis, a lot could be said about that, but I would say um, you probably, you know, people would say something like 10 to 25 sets uh, per muscle group per week um, a lot of people would argue for varying the rep range, maybe some five rep range, 10 rep range, uh, 15 rep range or something like that. Um, and you will, these sets need to be 80% of failure or some threshold like that to be, uh, significant enough. Otherwise they're warm ups and they wouldn't really count. Um, does that sound like a fair 10 second summary to you guys, or do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I was going to say there, start somewhere between 10 to 20 sets per muscle group per week. You probably want to do that over uh, each muscle group twice per week or more rather than once a week uh, for the muscle group uh, in terms of the frequency. Um, and yeah, I kind of don't disagree with any of the rest. Alex, do you want to add anything to the 10 second version? Yeah. Uh, five to 10 reps uh, per set, 40 to 80 repetitions per muscle per workout, two workouts per week. Cool. Um, Anonymous says, should we be concerned about high blood urea nitrogen on a high protein diet? 
My opinion is no. Uh, and almost everyone who eats a high protein diet usually has BUN toward the top of the range or slightly above it. What do you guys think? Drink more water. Uh, it's simply a concentration. So uh, your liver's capacity to metabolize ammonia is not limited. Uh, so if your blood urea and nitrogen is increasing, you just need to drink more water so you pee more of it out. Danny, anything to add? No, nothing to add there. Okay. Um, Anonymous says, besides leucine, any other thoughts on increasing protein synthesis to prevent sarcopenia in older adults who strength train regularly? I guess my quick answer would be everything that we talked about with muscle growth already. Do you guys want to add anything to that that's particular to older adults? Um, no, I think like Alex mentioned earlier, the, the per meal dose probably needs to be higher in older adults. So probably 0.4 grams per kilo at least. Um, and then there is some research suggesting, and it, again, still more probably needs to be done that there could be a potential role for something like uh, creatine supplementation. Um, omega-3 supplementation has also been looked at as well. Those two potentially could help overcome that anabolic resistance that was mentioned earlier. Yeah, I have nothing to add. Uh, eat more protein. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then final question, Nicholas says, would electrolyte imbalances such as a relative sodium deficiency be... This is a follow-up on what we were talking about with Chad before on DOMS, I think. Uh, could that be a potential cause of the fatigue associated with acidosis like I was describing for myself? Low pH and cell damage, driving extracellular potassium shift and also driving sodium excretion of the kidney on top of any sodium losses with sweating. If talking about exercise, sodium that would be used to restore resting membrane potential via sodium potassium pump, sodium bicarbonate transporter, sodium hydrogen antiporter, et cetera. Uh, so I think the, the gist of this question is sodium is sort of like universally used to transport things. And if you have acid accumulating, maybe that's because you're not clearing lactate, or maybe it's because you're not clearing hydrogen ions, or maybe you're not you know, pumping something that's going to act as a buffer at some part of that. And my short answer to that is, yeah, that's totally plausible. You'd have to test it out. Who knows if that's the limiting factor for any given person. Um, but it's certainly certainly when you're not well adapted to it, you lose a ton of sodium in the sweat. Um, you, you always use, lose sodium in the sweat, but you lose a lot less if you're well-trained. Um, but always sodium could be limiting there. Um, but I guess you just have to test it. You guys want to add anything to that? Mm, nothing that I can add. I think you uh, covered it perfectly. Yeah, I don't have anything to say. All right, cool guys. This was awesome. Looks like we lost Chad, um, but Chad was amazing. Danny, you were amazing. Alex, you were amazing. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for coming out for this. Um, I think when I hit end meeting to end this meeting, it'll end it for all of us. Uh, so I'll I'll follow Dan uh, Danny. I'll follow up with you by uh, email to thank you again for your contribution to this. Uh, this was really cool, guys. Thanks. Sure thing. You got it, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good day, guys. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. 
But if I spent hours dealing with recording equipment, plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium chain fats to keep my energy levels up too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. Com. That's amplemeal.com, A M P L E M E A L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believed that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. And vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to AncestralSupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. 
All right, thank you for watching and listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this Ask Us Anything. You can find more of Chad Macias on Facebook. You can find Alex at alexleaf.com, and you can find Danny at sigmanutrition.com. And of course, you can find me at chrismasterjohnphd.com. If you would like to get in on the next Ask Us Anything about a particular topic or the next Ask Me Anything, then consider joining the CMJ Master Pass. The CMJ Master Pass not only gives you access to regular Ask Me or Ask Us Anything sessions that are carried out live over Zoom. And these on average are coming out or on average are scheduled once a month. Sometimes I take a month or two off, sometimes I do two, three, or even occasionally four in a month. Um, but on average, these are out at least once a month. And you can sign up to Ask Us Questions live over Zoom. It's a lot of fun and you can put your question to the front of the line. Um, joining the CMJ Master Pass does not just give you access to these sessions. It also gives you another uh, a number of other really cool features. So number one, if you follow Mastering Nutrition, Chris Master, John Light, whenever there are episodes that are scheduled to come out, you get them as soon as they are produced. That often means that you get access to them weeks. Occasionally, that means months ahead of time. Sometimes you get access to 20 episodes of Chris Master, John Light that haven't come out yet. You also get them free of ads, which is really useful to those of you who find ads annoying. And then you also get transcripts of all the audio video content, which is extremely useful if you really want to uh, dive deep into the material and master it because you can go back between listening for familiarity and then using the text to keyword search or to take notes or copy and paste things. Um, and it's also great for those of you who just prefer to read. Then on top of this, I have a free course, Vitamins and Minerals 101. You can join the free course at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 101. But you get as a CMD Master Pass member, you get free access to the Vitamins and Minerals 101 Premium course, which right now has, instead of just getting the lessons as an email or as a series of Facebook messages, allows you to have access to all the lessons in one place where you can search across all the lessons by keyword, or you can download PDFs of each lesson, or you can click hyperlinks that go directly to each section. For example, if you only care about the dietary recommendations, you just go click dietary recommendations, vitamin A, click dietary recommendations, vitamin B1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it allows you to get a lot more uh, ease of use out of the course. And then Finally, uh, there are going to be additional features added to Vitamins and Minerals 101 Premium, such as quizzes, which will really help you master the material if you're interested in getting to that level of mastery. And then finally, the forthcoming Vitamins and Minerals 101 book, you get discounts of 30 to 50% off as members of the CMJ Master Pass. In fact, you get discounts on all kinds of stuff. You get $50 per session discounts on my consultations. You will soon be getting steep discounts that you can't find anywhere else on things like blue blocking glasses and the best sleep masks. And you can currently use your CMJ Master Pass uh, membership to get up to $450 off the price of a chili pad if you are interested in sleeping cool at night. So on top of premium features and early access and ad free access to all my content, it's also a big discount club. Um, so anyway, consider joining the CMJ Master Pass if you would like to. You can go to chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass slash mastering nutrition. Adding the slash mastering nutrition at the end will earn you a lifetime discount of 10%. And then whether you join the CMJ Master Pass or not, please come see me on the interwebs. You can find me at chrismasterjohnphd.com. You can also find me as Chris Master John or Master Nutrition in your favorite podcast app. And then you can find me at Chris Master John on all the major social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. All right, I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you in the next episode.